I'm sick of stifling smoke In the room I trapped myself in so long ago Where the blinds remain forever closed Will it change? I hope so Cause I have spent the past four years Trying to find some peace of mind And I think Ladies and gentlemen, here we are, Interviews with Everyday People. We are back, episode, I had it just that right in front of my face, 88. We're getting close to that 100 mark. Um, before we get started, I just want to let you guys know, if you are watching this on any platform, please hit that like, share, subscribe. Um, the live chat is up so you guys can talk to us. If you guys do join, that's fantastic. If not, I understand because I hit you with the surprise lives all the time. I said there might be something coming Wednesday, but I didn't give you the full the full details. But here we are. We are live with a guest. I'll let him introduce himself in one second. But like I said, his links will be below. Uh, we want to thank Punksteria for, for hosting and presenting this. Uh, if you don't know what Punksteria is, it's a, it's a young kid named Noah who's really into the music scene, and he's doing really, really cool things. So go support him uh, and Punksteria. Their links were there, there as well. We do have merch. If you do buy merch, make sure you send us a picture in your T-shirt so we can put you in the collage video that we're working on. Um, I think that's all the fun stuff. Um, our two, our two missions right now, our two goals are to bump up the Instagram as well as the, the, the Twitter and YouTube because I'm brand new to those platforms and I'm trying to get them up a little bit. So if you are watching this on Facebook, check the links, go over to the YouTube and show some love on that as well. We're trying to bump that up a little bit. But uh, what's going on, man? Hey, how are you? It's so cool to be on the show. Yeah, man. We talked for a little bit on uh, on Instagram, so see, it, the power of Instagram is working a little bit. Uh, let the let the guests know your name. I, it is in the links and the in the in the title description. But let's hear from you and let's hear a little background about what you're into and while we're while we're talking today. So I guess I have basically two things, if you want to say two things to promote or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of people will know me from your uh, in your listenership. Um, I'm Rick Becker on irockradio.me. I know you do a lot with Jay from irockradio.me. Um, I'm a disc jockey on that internet radio station. For some of your listeners from central Pennsylvania, from closer to the Harrisburg area, they may remember me as being Rick Becker on 105.7 The X. Um, Many, many moons ago, but I was there for a while. Then the other thing that I'm doing right now is I'm a travel agent. I now live in Florida, so I am also Rick from Ear to There Travel. I focus on mostly Disney and Universal, and I might talk with you a little bit about that later, but probably what we're most going to talk about (laughs) is music and stuff like that. Uh, we'll get into live. Listen, this this podcast. If you have listened to some episodes, or if this is your first time, we're gonna go on tangents. It's gonna take weird awesome. twists and turns. Uh, it's it's like the ADHD podcast. I think I was diagnosed when I was a kid. I just never went and f- physically took the uh, the full test. Um, so <laughs> it's like we'll talk about something, then we'll 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 tangent off for a little minute, a minute or two. So it's gonna be a good time. Um, awesome. Yeah. So so you originally from the Pennsylvania area, and then moved to Florida. Yeah, so actually I'm originally from the Pennsylvania area and I moved to Arizona and then to Florida. Hence the so Cardinals been, hat. Yeah, hence the Cardinals hat. <laughs> um, I, um, so, okay, actually, tangent. A okay. funny story is, and I don't know if, I'm in Florida and I just got a job. Yeah. A part-time job where I probably shouldn't be wearing a Cardinals hat, but I don't want to tip off who employed me, but... I was one of their many big acquisitions this summer. So, <laughs> interesting, interesting. Um, yeah. So um, until I actually show up and start working there, I don't want to say anything about it. But uh, yeah. But I think people can probably figure that out. So I shouldn't be wearing a Cardinals hat. But anyway, we'll go. <laughs> we'll go back. But yeah. So um, I grew up for most of my life. I lived in the Lancaster area, but. Lancaster, Harrisburg. Um, I was on 105.7 The X from, I mean, I got hired there when I was 16 years old. I worked there till I was 26. Um, So I worked there for quite a long time. 
Um, that's probably where a lot of people will recognize me. I also was the sports director for the statewide network in Pennsylvania, Radio Pennsylvania. I was uh, that radio network. I was the sports director there from 2007 till 2018. I lived in Arizona. I went there. I worked in radio and did some television work in the Phoenix area. And then my wife got a job in Florida. So we hopped the cats in the car, drove across the country one more time. And now we live in the Florida area. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm very jealous. We're coming up, uh, you know, fall is coming. And then once fall hits, uh, we get winter for four or five years. Um, so I'm very jealous that, you know, you're not getting that Pennsylvania cold and snow anytime soon. Well, that's why we did it. So, mm-hmm. so for- I, when I, when okay. I was working at Radio Pennsylvania, I had to get there at about three o'clock in the morning. So that's even before the snow plows start. Yep. So it was, it got to a point where I was like, I just don't feel like doing this anymore. Yeah. I love a lot of things about Pennsylvania. I'm not putting down Pennsylvania. It's the weather. Yeah. That's, that's the snow, only thing. Snow sucks. Um, so yeah, and, uh, you said you're from the Lancaster area, so obviously you heard the news about, uh, the Chameleon Club. Uh, oh man, uh, that's, that is a- absolutely devastating news. I know one of my friends said, oh, it was like a second home to us. And I'm like, yeah. I don't even know if it was a second home. I think I got my mail there in 97. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, they're not shutting down. They're just changing locations, but I don't know if they really said exactly where they're going to go. If they're staying in Lancaster, if they're going somewhere completely different, uh, but yeah, that's a that's a hit, man. It was a fun fun venue. Post- have you have you seen a lot of shows there? Not a lot, but I was starting to really dive into. I, I go to a lot of local bands, and then my um, I have a friend's band who's really doing really well. Uh, uh, they're called Crowbot. They're out of Pottsville, but they were doing like their I, the last show I went to was Crowbot at the Chameleon Club, um, and then I was supposed to go see Fozzie for the I Rock Radio Birthday Bash. Um, it was supposed to be the iRock Radio Birthday Bash, and it was supposed to be a group of us because my friend has started uh, his own wrestling promotion. And the night after his show, the Sunday was the Jericho show or the Fozzie show, and that was going to be like the blow off on all the wrestlers were going to go there and see the show. So it was going to be like a twofer, and obviously COVID uh, put all that to end. <laughs> no, that did not happen. Yeah, it's it's really sad. I mean, I've seen. At Chameleon, I've seen so many, like, absolutely legendary bands. I saw, before The Distance to Hear, live, did three shows there to just sort of try out new material. And, like, almost none of it ended up making it on the album. So we got to see these, like, three shows that were music that basically nobody else has really heard. Um, Chad Kroger from Nickelback asked me, at that club where he could find a replacement part for his bong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's certainly a lot of weird memories that I have from, from that club. <laughs> and in that spot of Lancaster, it shouldn't be hard to find a replacement part for your bong. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh no, I sent him right around the corner to puff and stuff, which was still there at the time. It was, I mean, it probably still is there. I don't know. I haven't been back since 2017, yeah. but, um, yeah, but not hard at all. <laughs> yeah. So um, how did you get into the, the, the music scene and also like then transitioning over to radio and, and do, getting that gig? Yeah, so the radio thing happened where it's actually kind of a, an interesting story. I, I always listen to radio, listen to, you know, I was always into radio, but never really put it together that I wanted to do it. But like I had autographs from like, morning show hosts that were in (laughs) Lancaster at the time or in Harrisburg at the time. And I always thought it was a big deal and something that interests me. Um, But when I was in high school, I had a knee injury, so I missed all of baseball season. And the one day I was kind of depressed about it. So we ended up going to the mall just to sort of hang out. And they were doing... um, 105.7 105.7 The X was the edge at the time. And they were doing a day at TGI Fridays. And I just walked up to one of the people there and I'm like, hey, how do you go about working here? And they gave me somebody's number. I called. I started putting stickers on CDs for free as an intern. 
And then one day somebody broke his foot, couldn't come in to run the board. So I showed up and once I ran the board, they had had to start paying me. And then once they had to start paying me, I started working on getting on the air. So it really kind of happened organically as far as that was concerned. But I just kind of, you know, worked my butt off for lack of a better term and Mm -hmm. um, just kept moving up and moving up and learning new things. And yeah. Nice. Nice. So if you had to say, do you have a favorite genre of music? Are you very open minded? Do you listen to everything? Do you have a do you have a, a a genre you're not into? Like, what's your what's your music wheelhouse? So I am into basically everything. I have, um, I definitely am on an artist by artist basis, where there's some artists that I just really love, but definitely, especially those who do listen to me on irockradio.me you'll know I'm a 90s grunge guy. Mm-hmm. Like, that's my thing. I'm, I'm the 90s guy on irockradio.me. Um, there's, for people who are watching, there's an Eddie Vedder poster right behind my head. Um, I'm a big Pearl Jam fan, a big Everclear fan. A lot of that 90s stuff is really where I gravitate. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I like my 90s as well. Um, probably the reason why I'm a huge fan of the one, the band I'm about to say is because of the nineties. And, um, it's funny cause he's not even, uh, he wasn't even a singer then he was a drummer, um, Nirvana. Then obviously I'm a huge Foo Fighters fan. So I, I personally feel, um, that if Jesus is to be reincarnated and come back to us, he already is here as David Grohl. Um, that's, <laughs> that's my, it's my personal belief. I think that man should be worshiped. And, uh, <laughs> I think he's a, I think he's, a, would be the third coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, how many times have you gotten to see them? I have never seen the Foo Fighters live. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. So, like, here's the thing. I, I, uh, I never really grew up with a lot of a lot of money. Um, and concerts were just something that it was like if we had money, it wasn't going to go towards a, a music show. And then as I got older, it was just like something I never really sought after because I'm like I, I didn't really grow up in it like I always grew up in a music family my dad was a DJ he used to go to like block parties and DJ um he grew up as a concert person but my first concert wasn't until my senior year of high school I went and seen uh Blink 182 and Green Day and I loved it and uh at Hershey Park and then um I, I think I don't I don't think I went to another concert until another like maybe 10 years after that um, so it's, it was like something I didn't really do like live sporting events. I only been to like, like two football games my whole life. I've only been to like one basketball game. Like it just like going to like see the professional level, I guess you would say stuff has never really crossed me, but like going to see a band at like a block party or going to see a band at a local bar. That's just like my favorite thing ever. Like I, I, I kind of like that lower level kind of stuff. Um, and then if they do make it to like the next level, then I really I do my best to go see their shows. Like my buddy's my buddy Crowbot's band, I go see every time they're somewhere within driving distance. I'll go support them and go see them on a bigger scale um, because it's something I've watched from a dive bar to uh, a big stage. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons that you know you that. Going to radio is is a good thing because a lot of those times you don't pay to end up at those shows. Yeah. <laughs> so that was part of the reason why I did that. But yeah, I got to see Foo Fighters. I've seen them a few times. Um, once was when they were doing their dual headline with uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Oh. They did played up at State College, and that show was just off the chains. Like they were both at the peak of their powers at that point. I saw. Foo Fighters down in Atlanta at Music at Midtown, I believe is what it's called, a big festival down there, because Pearl Jam was playing the other night. Right. Um, so I went down to see Pearl Jam and then saw Foo Fighters on the first night of the con- of the show. But the one time I saw Foo Fighters at Hershey, it was on the Red Hot Chili Peppers tour as well. And it was the last day the Foo Fighters were on that tour. So... The Chili Peppers like played some pranks on them or something, and Grohl was hammered off his <laughs> out of his mind, and it ended up being like a really awful show. The other two times I saw them, they were absolutely great. Yeah, but the the time at Hershey, I guarantee, knowing where you have a lot of your listeners, you know the area you are, 
when I talk about that show at Hershey Park with uh, Hershey Park Stadium with the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Foo Fighters, there are going to be people who remember how bad the Foo Fighters were that <laughs> night. Because Dave was very hammered. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, recently I've, I've gone to more shows. Um, my wife is really getting into going to concerts. Uh, so she, 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 I go to some shows with her, or she's been going a lot more than I have. Um, but we had, uh, I, I, I took her to see like three Steel Panther shows. Um, <laughs> and then she was like, you owe me. So then we, had, we went to go see um, Kesha and Malcolm Moore at, uh, okay, yeah. at, at Hershey. I like Malcolm Moore. And I only ever heard a Kesha on the radio, and she had that really whiny voice. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this for three hours. So me being the person I am, so I did a little research, and I'm like, wow. It's like This is when she was coming off that whole thing with her agent and her manager doing awful things to her and like, like terrible, terrible things. So I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to go in here a little more open-minded. I really want to see what's going on. And honestly, it's, it's, it was one of my favorite concerts. It was... It was very just every walks of life of people, very LGBTQ, um, like pride everywhere. Everybody was in gr- glitter and rainbow, and it was just like every m- form of life was at this show. And it was just very, it was a very pow- like a powerful movement. Like I was like, man, like when you grow up in a small little coal town and you can like on one hand count the diversity, whether whether it be people of color or different races or walks of life or sexual orientations and then you go to Hershey Park which is only an hour drive and they can fill a stadium with everyone who's just so open minded and willing to love each other and just have a good time with one another it was it was a really cool experience um and it, I was kind of disappointed I was like man this whole concert is here for Kesha like everybody was ke- Kesha'd <laughs> out and I was like Malcolm Moore's going to hit the stage last and people are going to leave and it seemed like it got even more packed when he hit the stage and it poured rain um and Malcolm Moore came out. I guess they tried to cancel the show because Hershey, they, they like to do that a lot. They like to shut things down <laughs> really quick. Um, and Malcolm Moore was like, they tried to cancel us backstage, and I told them it's not happening. Um, he goes, I'm from Seattle, ladies and gentlemen. In Seattle, we don't walk away from the rain. We embrace the rain. So we're, this is going to be a baptism by rain. Um, it's going to be a powerful movement. And it poured, and everyone had a blast, and they were dancing. And then the next day, Hershey Park flooded. <laughs> so it was a baptism, all right. <laughs> Yeah, that album for Kesha where she came back from having all the problems with the agent and everything. I was working at a pop station in Phoenix when that album came out. And when I put on when I played that first song, that first single off that album for the first time, I was like, This is incredible. This yeah. is so much better. She than has the a stuff fantastic that got her voice. She has a fantastic voice. She's super talented on the guitar. Her band is unbelievable. Um, she went up and did uh, Jolene by Dolly Parton and killed it. Like, I, I, I have a newfound respect for, I mean, she is still party, and I kind of dug that too, like where she's kind of free and she's just like, you know, kiss my ass, I do what I want type deal. And I was just like, yo, she's, she's awesome. Like, I dig it. Um, yeah, I left there a big fan. And then uh, a couple months later, my wife's like, yo, we're going to another concert. I already bought your ticket. You're going. And um, I went to Hershey Park to see the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> <laughs> um craziest thing about that show is the only time in my entire life I walked into the men's room at Hershey Park I had zero line and I was the only one in the bathroom it was like the movie Step Brothers I was like spinning I was snapchatting because I thought it was the craziest thing ever that I was in Hershey Park Stadium in the bathroom alone screaming having a blast I'm like I'm in the bathroom by myself and then the women's line is literally down and wrapped around the stadium and it got to the point where the women were just not having it anymore, and they were just flooding the men's room. They were like, "We're not doing this no more." So I was, it was, it turned into a a, 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 a multi-use bathroom at one point in time. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, I'll give it to I'll give it to the Backstreet Boys. They put a great show on. Yeah, one of the funniest ones, one of the funniest concerts that I have on my list is actually sort of up your way, up in, I guess it's in Musick or. Oh, yeah. Scranton or yeah. one of those, the ski lodge, this, the ski place that has concerts sometimes. I don't even remember what it's called, mm-hmm. uh, but I saw the Spice Girls. There. Oh, my God. We got free tickets at uh, the radio station. And actually, our program director was fired earlier that day. Wow. And we had tickets to the Spice Girls because, like, you know, no, no one 
wanted to go from the station. I'm like, I'll go. I would 100% win. We ended up sitting right next to the program director who got fired because <laughs> he got the other comp tickets. <laughs> We're like, oh, this is awkward. Like, <laughs> I'd have been, spice up your life, every boy and every girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know way too many lyrics of that that I, I'm proud to admit to. My cousin was a huge Spice Girls fan, and uh, I had to watch that movie and listen to the albums more times than I can probably uh, like to care to talk, talk about. Um, it was Gingerless, by the way. It was when Ginger wasn't in the band oh, anymore. Oh, so it was Spice Girls without Ginger. Oh, boy. That's, a, that's tough. Oh, my wife, my wife just came home from work, and she gave the whole boo hand. Are you, are you saying who cares about Ginger, or you're saying, oh, she said she doesn't care about Ginger. Never mind. I misread it. Um, or, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, being working in the radio, obviously you get your comp tickets. You get to meet, probably meet people, uh, do interviews. Uh, what are some of your highlights for that? So some of the ones I've done recently for irockradio.me, I've had some pretty cool interviews of late. I did a phone interview with Vinny from Sponge. That is a band that I absolutely love. And Vinny was cool AF. Like, he just, sometimes you'll interview artists and they want nothing to do with it. Sometimes... They're skeptical at the beginning, and then if you ask them questions they like, the floodgates will just open, and he was great. He just loved talking about the state of the music industry right now, talking about how he goes into putting together their live shows, you know, different projects that they've decided. He was cool. He was one of the highlights. I got to interview uh, Dave from Soul Asylum okay. uh, before one of his shows in... Um, in Tempe, Arizona. I've done a lot of, yeah, I mean, and then just met everybody. Actually, I guess a few weeks ago, it was National Radio Day. So a whole bunch of my friends were tagging me on Facebook with pictures of us meeting, you know, Pete Palladino from the Badleys, Incubus, Jerry Cantrell uh, from Alice in Chains, obviously, but when he was doing his solo stuff. Um, Corey Glover from Living Color. Um, I've met Everclear a bunch of times. I've done a whole bunch of these things where, yeah, it does. It almost sort sort of starts to blend together. Um, I here. Okay, here's a really funny story. So I was working at a country station down in Harrisburg for a little while. Oh boy! And this was when <laughs> Miranda Lambert had her first single. Like she was like no, she she wasn't really known by anybody. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was supposed to interview her, but the interview got canceled because, she's no, <laughs> because sorry, our my program camera, director, My camera's shaking like it's an earthquake. My dog is nosing it. I'm trying to snap my fingers to get her away from I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, my program director was worried that she wasn't going to be able to handle a radio interview. That's how early into her career it oh, was. Wow. But then, but she did leave and give me a hug. So now every time Miranda Lambert's on television, I'd turn to my wife and be like, she hugged me. Just letting <laughs> you know. Like, there's a little bit of competition here. Yeah. But yeah, so um, I've just ended up getting to meet a whole bunch of really cool people. We had, if you ever, you know, you're listening to a radio station or something and they'll have the artist say, oh, this is so-and-so and you're listening to. Yeah. I actually had Tony Iommi read one of those for me what? So it's like i'm tony iomi and you're listening to rick becker it was back when i was on 105.7 the x nice so like i like tony iomi said my name yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> now when you when you go into an interview with something like that obviously with my podcast i uh i'm interviewing everyday people right so i, I there's not a lot of time i i go in and i do research um it's funny man because i i get i get a lot of i get a lot of i guess not hate, but like people are like, oh, you're the, you're the bootleg Joe Rogan or you're the Joe Rogan wannabe. And it's like, I, we're very like-minded. Like I, I, I don't know much about his process. I listen to maybe one podcast ever for by him. I try to stay away from his podcast so I don't get influenced and I don't like, you know what I mean? Uh, even though I'm a fan, every time I do listen, I, I love what he talks about. I love his viewpoints. I like the way he goes into things. And what I found out, it's funny, is that he doesn't really prep. He doesn't like... He hits record and they have a conversation. 
And I, I think if I, like, going into the show, I, I, I would have named it Conversations with Everyday People, not Interviews. But, like, when you're interviewing a, 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 someone who's on a band and on a tour, obviously you want to you wanna get your interview. You're excited. I'm sure that's like a little bit of a general lush because you're talking to someone who's on a different tier or they're experiencing things on a level uh, that normal humans aren't experiencing. But you don't want to ask the same questions they've been asked 14 times by other radio stations and every other interviewer. So what's the strategy going into that? Yeah, so first of all, the first thing about Joe Rogan is I don't know how you stay away from it because the YouTube, YouTube algorithm He's all over is it. just like if you watch four videos in a row and just let them roll into each other, one of them's going to be Joe Rogan yeah, for right. some reason. I need to be on that He level. mastered that. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I'm doing an interview with an artist, um, it will depend a lot of the times on how much I do know about them. Like if I would get the chance – if somebody would call me tomorrow and be like, you can interview Eddie Vedder, I would be just like you. Like, it doesn't matter. I can just sit down and I can have a conversation with them for as long as it takes two hours. I'd be able to think of questions for yeah. them. But sometimes you don't know a lot about the artists and you'll find like with Sponge, when they haven't been popular for a while. So then you go and look into what have they been doing lately and a lot of times the different ways that these artists have stayed relevant, because the ones who are still doing it from the 90s is a great example. They're doing something unique to still be able to do it mm -hmm. because you have to really put together a niche. So I kind of look into what is their niche? How are they still together? Um, that's one with, artists who've been around for a while when it's new artists i think it's really easy to sort of do it the way you do it because you just get a couple things like where they're from what are some of their interests you already know how their music sounds you have a good idea of what some of their influences are or something mm -hmm. um the influence question i think they get all the time and i think it's kind of a weird question to ask a band because I believe if you listen to a band, you can tell who their influences yeah, are a lot. Absolutely. Of the time. Um, but it's definitely um, just finding the things that stick out to you and then finding what they think about the changes in the in industry. So many people get so specific about that band. And of course you want to help them promote their new album. You want to help them promote the show that they have coming up. That's all important. But a lot of times people don't ask them, how are you still doing this? The music industry is so different now than it was when we were listening to bands. It was bands would just sell millions of copies for having one song on alternative radio. Yeah. That doesn't happen anymore. So how are you navigating the new way that music has to be profitable mm -hmm. because it's not easy. And the ones who are still doing it or the ones who make it out of the small clubs and make it to the bigger venues are navigating the business just as much as they're coming up with good material. Cause that's just one part of it. Yeah. I mean like music and media has completely changed. So like for the longest time, obviously radio was the go-to place um, and you get your interview, but you only get, you know, your certain time slot because you had to get back to the music because people want to listen to music and not talk radio. But now in the landscape like podcasts where someone can sit and have a two-hour conversation and it's shocking that people who are into podcasts, if they see a 45-minute episode, they're like, I'm not listening to that. That's not even worth my time. I want to see those two. I want to see those hour 45 minutes. You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy how some people... <laughs> and then there's some people who see the shorter ones are like, oh, this is more my speed. Like, it's weird how podcasting has changed. But... um like music, like I think streaming services are the way to go for radio because you have more of that leeway. You could do kind of what you want. Um, you're not tethered to somebody. Uh, you have more creative control. You're your you're your own boss. I I really dig the the streaming radio a little more. Um, but even with like how you're saying music, you somebody instead of getting that one album where it would sell a bunch, now they get a whole bunch of plays on Spotify or YouTube or their music video. Um, music industry goes from being a band and going and kind of being terrible for two years and touring with your buddy in a, in a, in a van to you can go win a music contest on TV and now you're right on top of the game. So it's like, it's super strange how everything just overnight kind of just changed. 
Well, one of the things I really like about irockradio.me and, and working with Jay over there, and I'm kind of, I, I forget the exact title that Jay gave me, but I'm sort of in charge of doing the interviews and specialty programming and things like that. So I will do most of our musician interviews. And what we try to do is, yes, people want to get right back into the music So when I do an interview with an artist, a lot of times we'll break it into two of the best five minute segments and we'll play them in between the music. But we have a website. Yeah. So we'll be like, here's two five minute segments. But if you want to hear the whole thing, go to irockradio.me and you can listen to the whole interview. So then we can get more detail get more of a discussion sort of like yeah. what you have here. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, that was something actually I talked with Jay about a, a while ago and he was telling me he, he was just kind of maybe just starting that or he was looking into it. But then, if I'm not mistaken, um, you guys have your own podcast too. Like if you go on a podcast app type iRock Radio, I believe all of your interviews are there as well. Right, and we're working on actually really upping that at this point. Yeah. We're, we're hoping to... We were looking to do it, and then COVID happened, and we sort of had to reconfigure because we didn't want to be promoting shows that we weren't sure if they were going to be happening. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but we're we're starting to kick that back up again, and we're going to have a lot more interviews. But yeah, you can find a lot of our past ones. Um, I really like the format that we have there because it's not just rush through, ask the same five questions. You know, I remember like one time I didn't do the interview, but one of the DJs at the X interviewed Hoobastank. So of course they had to ask the question about how'd you get your name? And like, you know, these questions yeah. that they're getting all the time, but at irockradio.me, we can really discuss, like we can just sit down and be like, all right, let's, let's talk about what's going on here because the world's, a much different place. And a lot of times terrestrial radio doesn't want to address that. Yeah. I I'm very like, I, I get a lot of heat for this, but I've, we have, I, I'm uh, in my local area. We have our terrestrial radio and I'm very um, disappointed in the way they, they do things. I, I understand they have their format and they have to do what they have to do, but like we're in a scene right now where our, our local music scene is, is very good. And I'm, I maybe sound biased because we're, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of them, but I think they work really hard and they're super talented. And I, it just bums me that like we have a band from our town that is touring, has gone two world tours. You know what I mean? They've toured all over England. They just did a tour. Like they're doing very good, and they're not even in the rotation at their station. Like you would think, like you want to show pride to your community. Like they don't go to talk to local businesses unless the business is giving them money to show up there. It's like I, I just feel like they they missed the mark when it comes to showing local support. And uh, it, it bums me out. So, like, when I see a local podcast or a streaming thing, the, that's where you find most of the people are like, hey, we're going to show love to not just the top, but we're, like, like 97.9X is a, is a great example of Treasure Radio. I feel like it's doing it right. They have a segment every, like, uh, let's say Tuesday, and they have an hour-long block, and all they do is play upcoming unsigned artists. And, they, and it's, it's like, hey... A band from Pottsville, Pennsylvania is going to get the airways for an hour and they're going to get to play a couple songs. And then this band from Scranton is going to get it. And I think that's super important. And it, and it makes and, it, and, and you go to a show and you go see a concert. And if you walk in and you see irockradio.me shirts in the concert and you're like, oh, a radio station's here. That's cool. Like that's that's what music should be about. Like if, if you're going to see a band and you're part of a radio station, you should walk in with your with your with your terrestrial radio logo on or your irockradio.me and then when you walk into a venue they're like, "Oh, we can get some radio play." Like you want to bring that hype and spark back and I feel like we have a radio station that's not doing that and it's kind of disappointing to me. Well, yeah, and when I was at the X for example, that was right when Fuel blew up. Yeah. Like we were playing Fuel song off their independent EP. Like we were spinning you know, this they were a local band at the time. And then, yeah. of course, they blew up and became national. And we all know how that how that worked out for them. And they became huge. And sometimes you just have to give a band a chance. And it's great. I mean, I understand. Like, I've been on the other end of it. So I understand why they don't do it all the time. But there's a lot of times that you have local bands that sound 
just as good and make just as much sense in the rotation as some band that's being pushed by a record label that's never going to that you can tell is not going anywhere yeah you may as well play your local band and get some people excited about it absolutely and it just and i'm not saying that the entire radio but to dedicate a block like it, it was the point where people were you couldn't walk into a local business in our area and not hear that radio station and now it's to the point where everyone's willing to pay serious money and our, our Pandora and play background music from them then rather than support their local radio station because I feel a lot of them feel like their local radio station doesn't support them. And it's this weird disconnect, and it's, 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 it's frustrating because I feel like they have such a great platform to do things. And obviously I don't know the ins and outs, and, I don't, I, I, and I'm kind of armchair, I'm armchair quarterbacking it here. Um, but it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's just sad. It bums me out a little bit. But yeah, like I said, like I first time I met one of the first time I met you guys, we were at a show at Goodfellas, and there was iRock radio shirts and banners, and I was like, oh, this is like that's what you should be doing. Like you're like this is a radio station from Harrisburg that came to Schuylkill County to put a show on in our venue, and and they're right in the backyard of another major terrestrial radio, and it, it's not even they don't even know they have no idea what's happening in their own backyard. But uh, someone from Hale, from Harrisburg is coming down to our venue and showing love to our local music scene, and I was like. I, I gotta, I gotta go find out who's in charge of this, and I want to speak to them because I think I, that shows a lot for the character, and that kind of what drew me to iRock Radio and meeting Jay, and then meeting you guys. Yeah, we play uh, iRock Indies, is what we call them, and we're always looking for artists to send us music. So if you have a local band right now, go to iRockRadio.me, go to the iRock Indies tab. You. Know, you get a couple spins on an internet radio station and you have no idea what that can do for a band. We have listeners all over the world. Yeah. Like we have listeners in Germany, in Brazil. I forget what country it was where Jay said we were doing really, really well, like Denmark or something like we just had a ton of listeners. We started playing a band that was sort of like a local band in that country that wasn't getting a lot of, worldwide exposure and we started playing them and people started listening mm -hmm. so it's definitely a great way to get exposure what's unfortunately happened in terrestrial radio is they have changed the way they calculate the ratings so now it's just about keeping everybody for the next five minutes keeping them for another can we just get them to stay for another five minutes that's why when you listen to a radio station now They'll constantly be teasing what's coming up. In. They're never doing anything right now. They're always going to be doing something in five, ten minutes. Yeah. That's, they ingrain it. In, and, you know, I've gotten very good at doing it at various times, but it's kind of cool being on iRock where it's very much like, just sit down, put us on in the background. Let's just chill. Every once in a while, I'll pop on and tell a joke or something or tell you, what's going on with this artist but for the most part let's just enjoy the music and we don't have to worry about getting you for just stay for another five minutes if you want to go now that's cool come back later <laughs> We're, we'll be here for you yeah you know and that's what i like about it I, I definitely like your your guys tone your demeanor in that in that aspect too it's not like you're you're being pushy like even in the beginning when i'm doing hey hit the subscribe i know by statistics, that's what your posts say, so people can't hit that button because people don't. You'll get a person who will, like, 500 views and only two subscribers come out of it. So I know you have to do it, but, like, a part of me is like, oh, like, I don't even want to do that. I just, I'm just happy they're here to start. You know what I mean? Like, it's one of those deals, but I, I do like, I, I like your format. And uh, one of my favorite things that you guys do is before every song, you kind of give those factoids about the band or, like, hey, they're on tour right now, or you can check this out. or And I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, I didn't know that was a thing. Or, like, this band from the 90s and they're actually still on the road they're doing cool like it's like those little factoids keep me around that's one of my favorite things um and uh, you know and how you were saying before the exposure um i know for me i did a guest spot a couple times where i got to i got to pick a, a couple songs on a rotation i had a really good time doing it um and i had some people add like add the tornado tag podcast because i picked i think i picked fozzy and i was like oh well, we do a wrestling podcast and this is Chris Jericho and and uh, we we had a few people you know transfer over from the radio to come listen to our podcast because they heard it on iRock Radio. So you guys definitely do have reach and exposure, and it and it, it does help. Yeah, I'm actually working on starting a podcast right now. I'm not ready to 
plug it or anything, but I don't think anybody minds when you say something like, oh, like and subscribe, or they understand that you're not. It's one thing when somebody who's got a cool setup at their house and they're doing this and they're trying to say, please like and subscribe. I'm trying to make this thing a success. I'm trying to build this. But when you've already just been plopped down on a terrestrial radio station and you start saying, please, please, five more minutes, we'll give you a T-shirt, then it starts to get a little bit. Yeah. uh, A little bit. And I understand why they do it. That like they're not wrong for doing it. So don't let anybody, you know, if you're a program director and I apply at one of your radio stations in the next couple of years, don't think I don't understand exactly why you do it and I'll do it. Yeah. But it is um, just the way the business has sort of been crafted. It's not as much the fault of the people in the business yeah. as it is the business itself. Yeah. For a while there, um, terrestrial radio actually turned me off of music because you, you know, you, you, it's kind of like, I used to love this song, but it got played so much. I don't like it anymore. And that was a big thing too, where I, for a while there, like, that's why I, when MP3s became a thing, it's like, I can control what I listen to. So that was a huge thing where terrestrial radio to me kind of fell off where I wasn't a big fan of terrestrial. Radio. But one of the things that always kept me coming back is talk radio. I grew up, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of funny, but I've been listening to them since I'm probably seven seven eight years old I've, I've been listening to howard stern i'm a huge stern fan i i you know what i mean like so i've always been more into the talk radio when it comes to radio and, and hearing that cool stuff so i like when a radio kind of do does uh and I, but like the wacky the wacky morning that's tough for me sometimes too where it's like oh hey everybody <laughs> it's like oh boy um but but i am slowly getting back into the radio thing too or how with the rock I rock radio and and Sirius and stuff like that like the octanes and everything because um you 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 do miss on that opportunity of hearing something you you weren't going to hear before because you're not picking your own music um so I, I I do think that importance of uh of keeping a radio station in your back pocket every now and then so if you're in your car and you want to listen to what you want to listen to I get that but every now and then when you jump in if you're not listening to a podcast or you're not listening to your your iTunes playlist pop on to uh irockradio.me or any radio station for that matter and just be like open your mind to maybe a new band or a new song you didn't think was uh was around because i think that that aspect of consuming music is very important yeah absolutely i i understand what you're saying about some of those like um hey spit in the platters that matter yeah <laughs> checking your traffic and weather together yeah like, they have yeah, like a super fake really voice annoying. it's just like just be yourself man like like growing up as a Howard Stern fan and he would just listen like, Oh, back in the day when I had to talk like this, he's like, I hated it. And he goes, this is just me being natural. And I have always gravitated to that. Just someone being themselves because being genuine definitely, um, shines through, I think a lot more. Yeah. Um, I think he has the way he has adapted and how his show has changed. has just been remarkable over the yeah. years. How- he he's a completely different show now yeah than he was um you know even when i used i did overnights on the x right before so i was on right before howard and um so i would hear him every day on my way you know on my way home and usually whoever was responsible for running the howard stern show on our end would always show up late anyway so i'd have to run it for the first hour (laughs) but um yeah, he's so much different now than he was back then. It's it's he has really adapted and turned into, you know, one of those, you know, veterans of broadcasting yeah. where he now gets the interviews with like I think earlier this year, last year he interviewed Hillary Clinton. Like yeah. Yeah. that would have never happened in the nineties, you know. <laughs> I'm not a I'm I'm not a politician. I hate I actually personally hate politics, but I, I tr- he was trying to get her when she was doing her run her campaign right. run and she said no. And uh I, I think that was a huge mistake on her part. I think that would have definitely helped her um when it comes to I mean, she didn't really need it. She did win the popular vote. She just lost the electoral college. But um I just just for her coming back her her coming and doing it after the election was I mean I'm not a fan of hers, but I thought it was I thought Howard did a great interview. He asked a lot of really 
an interesting question. Is like, how do you show up to a inauguration speech of someone who just beat you for presidency as being the first lady? Like, like there was a lot of really interesting questions. Um, the one he did with Paul McCartney was unbelievable. Uh, Lady Gaga was a great interview. Like, I, I, I that's why I, I wanted to do this because Howard and and Rogan can sit down and have a conversation with somebody, not so much an interview. It's almost he blurs the lines of interview and conversation because he's so talented at it, and he can make someone who you didn't think where you were interested in before. And then by the end of the interview, you're like, I'm a fan of that person. And I didn't think I was. The thing about Howard is I heard an interview with him. He interviewed uh, Billy Joel. I don't know when it was, but it was, I saw it recently. It just came up in my YouTube algorithm. (laughs) So I was watching. I'm like, Oh, I like Billy Joel. And he got Billy Joel to tell a story about the first time Paul McCartney came over to his house to jam and how Billy Joel had to run through all of his refrigerators to get all the meat out of it because he knew how Paul McCartney was this huge vegan. So he didn't want Paul McCartney to like open the refrigerator, see meat and be like, I'm never coming over to this guy's house again. So like, that's the kind of story that it's relatable that Stern can get it out there, but then it makes the musicians like Billy Joel, who's one of the biggest artists in the history of music is telling a story about how he's fanboy geeking out over somebody. He's hiding meat. Like you would think like people like, Oh, Billy Joel has a personal assistant. He probably doesn't even open his own fridge. You know what I mean? He's, he's stashing meat in drawers. So Paul McCartney doesn't get offended. It's, it's insane. Well, anybody who's seen Billy Joel recently knows Billy Joel has no problem opening a fridge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's very true. Um, honestly, that's a huge reason why I'm a Grohl fan. Like every single time you you see an interview with Grohl, or you see or you hear Grohl, like or he speaks, or you go see him or watch him, he's just super genuine all the time. Like you feel like you're, you you feel like if you were to ever to meet him, you've already done it because he's just he's just that person. He seems like he's that person all the time. And I, I just, I, you know, I mean, like that's that's important to to get that out on certain musicians because some people are like so sheltered and put away that you think they're just like lo- like you f- almost forget they're human. You're like they're because they're on a, another plateau. And then if you have someone like Stern who can bring that out, you're like, oh my god, like I didn't think that was a thing for them. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they still physically do that as humans. <laughs> like, of course they do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. It's like feed me grapes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that is that is funny. No, you don't think of and then, you know, no matter how no matter how big you are, no matter how much of a celebrity, there's always somebody who's a little bigger in something else. Like you see when Bob Dylan got the presidential medal of freedom and you know, that was back I guess President Obama gave that to him. And like you know, that's Bob Dylan. Like, you would think nobody's bigger than Bob Dylan, but then somebody's bigger than Bob Dylan. And then, of course, any, you know, whatever, like, I'm, I'm not I'm not talking about politics, even though two politicians happen to come up in my yeah. conversation. But, like, and then, you know, he probably meets somebody who was his idol as a kid. Like, nobody... The fact that these people get so big, but they're still geeking out over somebody like, you know, I, I met Eddie Vedder once and I was geeking out about it. And then he meets Pete Townsend and he's doing the same thing. And I'm sure (laughs) Pete Townsend met, met Chuck Berry once or something like that. It, you know, the, the chain is so cool that they are all everyday people, if you will. Yeah. And, and that's the thing too, is like, people always ask me like, will I ever interview someone of that, of like a celebrity? I'm like, if a celebrity ever wants to do this show, sure. But it's not going to be that type. I want to know about what their life was as a kid in high school. Like, I want to know about like what they're into. Like, I, I, I don't, like we'll probably not talk about anything that you're, <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause I want, I want to like my goal as an inter- a, a conversation is would be, to humanize you. And I, you know what I mean? I, and I would probably, I, I'd want to know the weird things like, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know. It's strange, but yeah. Uh, I, I interviewed at HMAC, the Harrisburg Midtown yeah. Arts Center. I set up there um, three times already. I've been there. Yeah. Great venue. I interviewed um, from the band city of the week. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. No. Uh, their lead singers, uh, Steph. And, um, we ended up getting to the point where she started talking about how she was like this classically trained vocalist. 
and that when she started getting into um into rock music and and being in a rock band that like her grandmother started like giving her a little bit of crap because like she was wasting her talents or whatever yeah and it's like man that's the kind of stuff you want to like you want to hear my grandmother doesn't like me doing this. Like, yeah. that's what I want in an interview. <laughs> because a lot of people, too, they think, like, if they want to start creating or if somebody wants to be a musician or a podcaster or or anything. Like, I mean, I'm not big at all. And I'm, I'm not trying to come off as I'm anything that, other than I am. But I've had people come up to me and they're like, oh, man, I'd love to be in your show, but I know I'm not. I'm not, I'm not worthy. I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, oh, you're super busy. I don't want to bother you. I, I, I was going to ask if you want to do my show, but I didn't, I didn't think you're, and like, what are you, I'm like, because if you pr- put a perception out of like, especially if you're promoting yourself and you're putting, and your, your grinds out there and people are seeing that sometimes even pre- people on a lower level perceive you as something you're not. And I'm like, I still punch a time clock. I go to work. I mean, right now I'm not, I'm, I'm furloughed because I'm not essential. Um, but I, like, I, I go to work every day. I, I do everything like you guys do. Like, I, I am very busy, but if you if you want me to, to do something for you, I will set time aside and hang out with you and work out. Like I have friends who won't ha- message to hang out with me because they're like because they see I'm doing something every night. I'm like, no, hit me up. Like <laughs> like it's not, it's I don't know. It's it, it's but when people are creating and they hear an interview or something, I, I got off tangent there. But if people hear an interview of someone who's famous and they're like, oh yeah, I didn't have support of my friends and family, and then someone else is creating and they're like, oh, I'm going through that right now. So I can keep pushing and get to that next, like this person went through that, the same thing. I, like it's relatable and people who are creating can turn around and say like, oh, they went through this too. It wasn't just like, cause everyone thinks just success happens overnight. They don't realize the, the, the 10,000 hours you have to put in or the grind you have to put in to get there. And, uh, so it, it is nice to hear people who have succeeded. Um, you hear their, their path of what they had to go through to get there. Yeah. And it's to just sort of realize that, when you hear, like, when you hear Dave Grohl, you as somebody who thinks Dave Grohl is almost, you know, the the next level to to God or whatever, <laughs> he's very close. <laughs> and um, and you hear him say like, oh, and then I had this X or Y issue mm-hmm. that you totally have yourself, and you're like that, like, I can do that. <laughs> like yeah. I can be like, obviously we're not all, you can just be born with Dave Grohl talent and that happens. But even there are probably so many people born with Dave Grohl talent who didn't also put in Dave Grohl work. Yeah. And there are people who were born with no talent who put in Dave Grohl work and now they're kind of successful. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so, it it doesn't have to be like these people aren't unattainable. These goals aren't unattainable. So if you want to try something, just do it, man. Yeah. Like life is too stinking short to not try the thing. Yeah. But be prepared to put the work in. It's not just going to, you're not going to make one video, put it online and you're going to get successful. It just, I mean, and if you do awesome for you, <laughs> but there, there is, there is a lot of work that goes into doing that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's, that's what fascinates me is hearing people's, their work ethic going in. Um, is there anything else music wise that you want to go before we shift gears here? No, I mean, I think, um, I really just, uh, listen to irockradio.me. Uh, we are in a transition period right now where we're trying to get ready. We're trying to figure out as everybody is like, how does life work? now with the whole covid situation but we're gearing up to get a whole bunch of interviews we know that eventually these artists are going to start getting out there again we're going to be getting amazing new music new putting it together so a lot of these artists right. have been recording like crazy so this covid is, is going to be like a like a rise of the phoenix when it comes to creativity and, and artist stripping and, and stuff like that because these people are going to come out the gate with some heat, <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause they've been working. Um, you're going to see a lot of solo projects. You're going to see people from bands doing things you didn't think they were going to do. Cause people are just trying to find things to, to do to keep their time occupied. Well, and think about all the concerts from 2020, for example, that have been pushed off till 2021. Like I have some, um, Alanis Morissette, garbage and Liz fair. were coming. Oh, around wow. Here. 
like I'd, I said, I'd like to see Alanis more set. I would love to see Alanis. She, oh, speaking, I've seen her a ton. Speaking yeah. of God, there, there she is right there. Speaking of God, of course, <laughs> if you like, of course, if you like this long form talking format, you like Kevin Smith. Uh, There's huge, no way yeah. that you don't like just BS talk <laughs> yeah. and not like Kevin Smith. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fun. Well, here's and, a fun fact. I had a whole bunch of like pop vinyls, you know, those little toys they that got really popular and they blew up um i had a closet full and i had comic books and statues and a lot of this pop culture reference because i'm really into that kind of stuff um i sold almost all of it to start my podcast equipment because kevin smith inspired me because he wanted to be a director and he sold all of his comics to make the movie clerks so not only am i inspired by rogan and howard stern but i'm also very inspired by kevin smith because sometimes you have to give things up to 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 make your dreams happen like i said i'm not made of money so a lot of the equipment i have was just selling stuff that i'm very proud of or very that was very valuable to me but i knew that if i wanted to get to this level i had to i had to get money somehow and uh, so yeah i'm a huge kevin smith fan and if anybody doesn't understand why we started talking about kevin smith out of the blue in the movie dogma Alanis Morissette plays, well, spoiler alert, but yeah. you should have seen it by now. Um, Alanis Morissette plays God in that movie. Yep. <laughs> so if you're kind of wondering why we all of a sudden went on that tangent. But yeah, Kevin Smith is absolutely one of my, my heroes. I actually have this, uh, for the people who are watching, this poster back here is from uh, Jay and Silent Bob Reboot. Yeah. Um, when I went to that Reboot Road show. But anyway... Um, the Alanis Morissette Garbage and Liz Fair show was supposed to happen back in June, and now it's already scheduled for, like, August 18th of next year. So, all, like, all the shows that you didn't get to see in 2020, they don't want to give you a refund for that ticket. So that's going to be happening next year. Yep. And then all the artists who weren't going to be touring in 2020 but were going to be touring in 2021 are going to be touring. It's gonna, everybody's going to be out next year. If you want to see if you want to see some good concerts, next year is going to be the year you're going to get them. Now here's a question for you, because uh, I'm always very pro consumer because I'm an everyday person. Not everyone has a lot of money, and I, I think I think a lot more people on the higher up should think of that. Now you're going into 2021, right? Now you realize that the economy's trying to reboot. People don't have money. Do you think we see concerts cheaper than we normally do? I could see us seeing concerts in a different way than we normally do. I could see them maybe being the same price, but having less people. So maybe they'd be more of a value okay. than, than they are now. I could see a lot of stuff like that. This is, um, I mean, this will probably end up bleeding into the other thing we we're going to talk about very well, but a lot of stuff is going to be changing. Um, and a lot of it will be getting more, pro-consumer depending on what is your definition of pro-consumer i don't think everything is going to get cheaper a lot of things will get cheaper but a lot of things might become a better value as well and as somebody who you know if you struggled with money and you're thinking like i didn't have a lot of money to spend on a concert but now when you spend that money on a concert you want to make sure it's worth it. Yeah. So there's value and there's cost, and they're two different things. If I spend $25 on a concert that was awful in every way, I don't feel like I'm glad I spent that $25. But if I spend $100 on a concert and it's the greatest experience of my life, that was worth it. Yeah. So I think we have to one of the things that people should be focusing on is making sure the experience is worth what you pay for it because people are going to have a lot less disposable income. So if you're going to ask them to pay a lot, you got to give them a lot. Yeah. And if you're going to not give them a lot, then you're going to have to drop your prices probably. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, we had tickets for a concert that got can't, well not canceled, but pushed back. Uh, uh, Fallout boy, Weezer and green day. I was really excited for that one. Um, so I don't know when that one got rescheduled for, but that one, uh, hopefully with the chameleon club, I hope Fozzy, I can go see Fozzy. I had, I don't, I don't think I bought tickets uh, immediately for that show. I, I don't know. My wife buys them everything, but yeah, we had that. <laughs> we had a festival that we we're going to go to the office festival. It was like a weekend long thing for office. 
um, in Scranton. Right. Yeah, that got pushed back. But yeah, there's a lot of a lot of interesting stuff. And like how you were saying, everything's gonna like every weekend's gonna be packed with something going on soon. Hopefully. You know, we were talking about we had just been talking about Kevin Smith, and I think this conversation is what he that we're having right now is what he does so well. Yeah. He he finds ways to make the things he wants to do accessible to the people who want them. Mm -hmm. So maybe he'll do like his reboot road show when he toured his movie and he would do a Q and a with Jason Mewes who plays Jay and they would go to a different city every couple of nights, play this new movie. People would pay for the Q and a and basically get the movie free. And then that drives up and makes his movie look like a success. Yep. You give people a better a better value, and you might not have a hundred. You know, you might not have like Foo Fighters amount of fans, but you don't need Foo Fighters amount of fans to be successful in whatever business you're doing. Your podcast, your YouTube channel, all of those things are going to be super successful. You don't need Joe Rogan number of people listening. Yeah. You need a small fraction of that, and you can make it successful if you're smart about how how you do it. Yeah, you know, we made a we made a point. We're pro wrestling fans, and I, my one friend, he's not really. I mean, he's in a podcast, but he's not into sports at all, so he doesn't listen to any sports related podcasts. And recently, I don't know if you're a pro wrestling fan, but there was a match between a guy named Adam Cole, who's from the Lancaster area originally. Uh, he wrestled Pat McAfee, and my friend's like, "What's the payoff for that? Like, who's Pat McAfee?" And I was like, "Pat McAfee's a." phenom when it comes to podcasting and they're like well why what's the purpose of him doing it i'm like it's weird like we're in a weird realm right now where you can get a movie star or a celebrity or a musician and that's cool and everything but and they have their fans but people who support podcasts or people who support video game streamers for some reason or people who are on like the social media platform are youtube people and they have a million subscribers I would say out of those million subscribers, I would say a good 600,000 of them are very, very loyal subscribers and people who listen to that. So if you, even if it's not that much of people, like, I mean, 600,000 people is a lot, but like if you go and you do a platform with somebody, you're bringing baggage with you. And I, I think I think that social media platform and the podcasting and the, the game streaming and that content creator thing is almost becoming as valuable, if not more valuable than people who are in, like... So on A-list celebrity statuses because the A-list celebrity status, we don't really know much about those people. But when you watch a game streamer or a podcast and you consume and you listen to them talk and you you, you know them as people, they become you, you become more attached to them because you're more they're more accessible and they're more you know more about them and you know more about their personal life rather than a celebrity. So I, I so like how you're saying Kevin Smith, Kevin Smith has crossed over from a director, but he's also like, you know so much about his personal life because he's opened it up to you more because of his podcast and, and, and knowing his personal details or how he feels about certain things. And I, I think that was a very smart thing he did and he's killing it. Like, and he's one, he's known as one of the most genuine people on the planet. Like everyone, like there's not many people who don't like Kevin Smith. You know what I mean? Like, and even if he makes a stinker movie, you're like, eh, it wasn't the greatest, but it's Kevin Smith. We love him. You know? <laughs> No, it's funny that you talk about that, too, because um, and this will transition into the other thing probably pretty well. But yeah. down here, because I live in Florida and, um, you know, we talked about me being a travel agent and working at Disney and stuff. There's a whole cottage industry down here of people who this is going to blow your mind, probably who go to theme parks and videotape themselves and put it on YouTube. Yep. There is a whole theme park YouTube community and. Like you'll, you'll see the people, you know, out in the parks every day. I'm, I'm met one of them yesterday and it does kind of feel like, you know, they get the best type of celebrity. Like you can get the best type of celebrity doing this show. Uh, I had it when I was working in radio where you can like be famous when you're doing work stuff, mm -hmm. <laughs> but then go to the grocery store and nobody knows who you are. Like yeah. it's the perfect balance of when i'm wearing an irockradio.me shirt people know i'm that guy but when i'm not 
I get to now my cat's meowing, by the way. So your dog was licking the camera. And now <laughs> my cat's chasing a bug in here. So sorry about that. That's all right. Um, it, it is a definitely like a cool kind of, you know, pseudo celebrity that <laughs> is is better in a lot of ways yeah. than being super famous because you don't have people following you around. But maybe, you know, you'll be at a concert and somebody will be like, oh, I, you know, I've heard his, um, you know, interviews with everyday people podcast. And he seems like a cool guy who likes the kind of music I am. And then you'll take a selfie with him, And like, yep. that's, that feels fun. That's fun. That's a good t- type of thing. I got, so. I got asked one time why I'm shopping in the dollar general. And I was like, what do you mean? They're like, dude, you're all over the internet. I was like, I'm. Um, thank you for subscribing. I'm in your algorithm uh, algorithm now. But I, dude, I still need to shop at Dollar General. <laughs> people, people have absolutely no idea. When I was 19 years old, any schmuck can make a YouTube video. <laughs> Just saying. When, when I was 19 years old, I um, I got f- hired full time in radio. Like that was when I had my first full time radio job. Yeah, I was doing overnights on before Howard on the X. People were like, oh, man, you're full time in radio. You must be. I made twelve thousand dollars a year. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But because you're I was you're pulling accessible. down a grand a month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and people just thought like, oh, I see you. You, you were at the car dealership selling expensive cars. Yeah. Those cars were three years' salary for me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny how it's perceived, but uh, so yeah, you said like the whole niche of uh, um, the the people who go to theme parks. Now, I've only been to Disney once. We we are trying to figure something out because my wife really wants to go down there, um, but I also really want to do Universal because. I mean, I've never been to Universal, but Universal has always been something on my bucket list because, you know, growing up watching Nickelodeon, um, they, they sold Universal like crazy. Um, but, yeah, so so we'll get into a little bit down there. I'm sure you've done both parks. Um, the last time I was in um, Disney was, holy shit, Heidi. Oh, she went upstairs. Oh, she won't even help me in this. I, I forget. It was like September, but it was like. Two th- maybe I think it was like 2005, 2007, between 2005, 2007, uh, that was the last time I was at Disney. And they say it's a magical place, and they are not wrong. Uh, it, was, it was a blast. Um, the only advice I would give people, especially if you're an adult going down there, is completely let go. Like, don't throw your ego away and be a kid the entire time you're there, and you will have the greatest time of your life. So one of the things definitely, and I totally agree with that because like at one point it's just like, whatever, I'm getting my picture taken with the princess. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> like I'm, um, I want an autograph from a guy in a costume, like just embrace it and you'll have a great time. <laughs> no, you will definitely have, but it's also, especially in the years since you've gone now, now Disney owns Star Wars Yeah, <laughs> and now Disney has marvel now there's not a lot of marvel stuff on the east coast and that's you know for whatever but guess what good news the the marvel stuff's at universal so yeah um you you know there is the the thought that theme parks are just for kids is kind of a you know a crazy thing like yep there's a lot of stuff for kids to do but there's also a lot of stuff that they can't do because they're too short like there are a lot of great roller coasters. There are a lot. There's lots of great theming. Um, that's one of the things that got me back into it. We went a bunch when I was a kid. Um, we would come down from Pennsylvania. Um, it was sort of like the perfect middle class vacation. Expensive enough that it was a big deal, but not a hundred percent out of the realm of possibility for a middle class family. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, we came down a lot, and then. You know, I became a teenager in rock and I'm too cool, you know, whatever. So then I had that. And then I started going back when I was an adult. And then I started noticing the things you don't notice as a kid, like all the detail that's put into, you know, like you ride Expedition Everest as a kid. And you're like, oh, this is a fun roller coaster. But you ride it as an adult and you're like, man, how did they do this stuff? (laughs) Like 
this is incredible. There's, you know, the track flips over here and then there's all this detail. And yeah, I absolutely, um, you know, my wife and I, we don't have kids. We're not going to have kids. Same like, here. We, yeah, <laughs> we are 100% adults who, who do Disney and we do Universal. Um, I'm an annual pass holder at both. I book vacations uh, for people at both. Um, I love them both. There's a lot of competition where people love one or the other more. I didn't start going to Universal until um, I lived down here. Um, but I absolutely love them both. I figure that the more they push each other. So are you a Star Wars fan or are you a Harry Potter fan? Or I am not like that. I've never seen a Harry Potter movie. I watched the Star Wars series one time. So, I, I mean, I appreciate the Star Wars lore. Um, I think it is very cool, but I, by all means, I am not a diehard Star Wars fan. Like, like I, 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 like Star Wars fans, when something new comes out, they run and go consume it right away. I'm the guy who's like, I'll wait like five years, and then I'll like, I have not seen any Mandalorian yet. I've, I've never watched any of the anime series. Um, I think the, the last, I, I don't even think I've seen the last. No, I did. Is it the last one? With where they fight and the whole planet is like red rock and the red the ships hit it and the rocks the red dust and stuff's go. Is that the last Star Wars movie? The la- last Jedi. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, is that the last no, one they was, made? There was one more after that. Oh, see, I see. I'm not even caught up in that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there was one that came out in December. Okay. Rise of Skywalker. Oh, but yep. here's here's my thing. I went. I had. I saw an ex girlfriend made me watch. Um, you know, Star Wars, A New Hope, like the first one. And then I think the one day she also made me watch The Phantom Menace. Okay. Um, when she made me watch The Phantom Menace, I should have broke up with her right then. No, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> um, instead of two years later. Um, but I had seen those two Star Wars movies before I stepped foot in Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. And now I have a baby Yoda over here. Mm-hmm. I've got, like... That being in that land turned me into a fan. Yeah. Star Wars Galaxy's Edge at, at Hollywood Studios in Walt Disney World. It's unbelievable. They have all the Harry Potter stuff in Universal. And while the Harry Potter stuff is incredible. It looks like, amazing. I've seen people who went there and took photos and video. It looks unbelievable. It's breathtaking. It did not turn me into a Harry Potter fan. I think I already had enough of a uh, i don't know if i want to do that my wife's a harry potter fan but i i you know it didn't turn me into a fan but i still go there every time i'm at universal i'll just sit in diagon alley that part of their wizarding world of harry potter and i'll just like look at it i'll just sit on a bench and just look around at how cool it is yeah without even having to ride a ride or anything um but yeah and when you were talking about concerts changing theme parks are going to be changing and i'm hoping that a lot of it is for the better yeah and i hope that we get a lot more value like right now because they have limited capacity to keep up with social distancing and to just try to not have you packed on top of each other so now a lot of people are talking about how well they're not doing fireworks or they're not doing this or they're not doing that which is true and if that's an important part of it for you, like that's something to take into consideration. But I'm in a theme park that hardly has anybody else in it. Yeah. So if every ride is a 20 minute wait instead of an hour wait, that makes your ticket so much more valuable. Agreed. And yeah, we're really, we've really been having a lot of, I'm a little worried that I'm going to be spoiled for when all this is over. <laughs> yeah. I have to start waiting in lines again. <laughs> yeah, the uh, so we'll we'll focus on Disney now because I can I can relate to some of the conversation for a little bit. I mean, everything has changed, but uh, so there's a few things that I experienced in Disney that I didn't I didn't we didn't know about until I think like two days before we left or a couple days before we left because you don't realize how much is uh, is really underneath how you were saying like under under like you don't realize it's there until someone kind of lets you in on it like the insider secrets um for us the hidden mickeys once we found out that there's things hidden mickeys in the park every line that you're in every ride every restaurant you're like all right they said there's three of them in here 
where are they? You know what I mean? Like, and you're, it, it keeps you occupied. It keep like, while you're waiting in line, there's like, even when you're waiting in line for an hour, there's stuff to do while you're in line. There's, there's aesthetics to look at. There's like, holy crap, they put that much detail in that, like that kind of thing. Um, and then the other thing that really took off for us, I don't know if they still do it. I, I hope to God they do is the pins, the, the pin collecting and the pin trading. Oh yes. my God! Is that like crack cocaine? I was like an I was like <laughs> I was like a middle I was like a twenty some year old kid. I was too cool for school. Like I was just like oh I'm a rocker. Like how you were saying, right? And we got there, and I just remember looking at employees like, "What pins you got? What pins you got? Come here, right?" So like, <laughs> so I remember trading with somebody for a pin, and they had a King Louis pin. And my favorite movie of all time is The Jungle uh. Book. I love The Jungle Book. And I walked up and I was like, I'd like you. And they, and they can't deny you unless they have a green lanyard. But even then, they kind of work with you. And I was like, I'd like to trade you this pin for your King Louis. And the lady looked at me and goes, okay. And I was like, what? And she's like, um, don't trade this one. And I was like, what do you mean? I said, like, I have no intentions. But she goes, just, just do me the favor. Like, I wouldn't even put it on your lanyard. Put it in your pocket. Just put it in your <laughs> back. And I'm like, why? She goes, when you get home, Google it. Like, eBay it. And I have this King Louis pin, and it's super, super old. It's like a really, like a rarer pin. Um, the the year actually here, I could timeline where we when we went there. The year we went down there was the last year that they called it. Um, what was it? MGM. Yeah, Disney's MGM yeah, Studios. They, yeah. The the following month or two, it was all get like they took they were the the giant Mickey hat that was getting taken out. That was all getting mm-hmm. so I, we have a pin of that Mickey hat and that like and the MGM, the pin the MGM park pin and she's like don't get rid of that pin because that's not going to be a thing anymore. So we ha- like that was yeah. like the tail end of that stuff. Um, when we were there, the big thing was I think the they were on one of the Pirates of Caribbean, so that was a big deal. Like all the pins, all the Disney characters they had like Mickey as Captain Jack and all these like that was the big deal was the Pirates and we were there at that time. But it was. Like that kind of stuff, like is so you don't know because they don't advertise it. You know what I mean? Like it's one of those insider things. Yeah, pin collecting actually just came back recently. Like the last couple weeks, they've been doing pin trading again because they didn't want people touching. Um, I think one of the things that we found out is it doesn't it doesn't contact by touch as much. Yeah. Uh, the the COVID stuff. So if you're keeping your hands sanitized and you're washing your hands, like wearing a mask, you can pick, yeah, you can pick a speaking of a pin off a board. <laughs> you you can pick a pin off a board, and it's not as dangerous as they had initially thought. So they did bring pin trading back, and I've seen, and people are so excited that it's back. Oh, it's too. so much fun! It's not something I do, but it is like you said, it's like crack to some people, and they just get into it. And like I have these posters behind me, there are people who you'll do a Zoom call with them for work or something, and all they have behind them are just boards <laughs> with Disney pins on them. It's pretty insane. Yeah, yeah, they definitely like that. And like you talked about the detail, a couple of, of my little, just like the little ones that I love the most are in Disney's Animal Kingdom. They have an Africa section and then an Asia section. And when you walk from Africa to Asia, there's a bathroom there that is designed to look like it's in the Middle East because the Middle East is in between I did not Asia know that. and Africa. <laughs> so it's like they went to this detail of doing this one bathroom <laughs> that's supposed to look like the Middle East. Well, you could stand there and stare at that tree all day long and find an animal oh. you didn't know it existed that was on there before. The Tree of Life. Yeah. The Tree of Life at Animal Kingdom has... Um, has animals carved into it. So it just looks like a big tree when you're far away. But as you get closer, you start to see that there are these animals in it. And yeah, it's just, those are some of the best pictures I have. Like I'll just go in the, to animal kingdom and just walk around the tree all day. taking. Pictures. I had a lady scare the hell out of me in animal kingdom. Cause she would literally was on stilts and she was standing on a pole and she looked like vines that were around the pole. And it was a, freaking human and i didn't know she and then she like kind of leached down at me i was like whoa <laughs> like, are you kidding yes, me yeah yes. divine her name is divine okay and yeah she is um she blends in she meshes in you'll see her destroy children sometimes <laughs> like they will 
like there are some it's funny and i love it and she makes some great memories but i the, every once in a while there's that kid yeah who is not having any of it <laughs> uh well animal kingdom also has a hidden uh because i'm a jungle book fan i didn't know this existed and i think the way it landed was we found out about the hidden stuff and then our, we went to Animal Kingdom because we stayed on resort. So I don't know how much of this is still a thing, but we stayed at the Rock and Roll All-Star Museum. So when you stay on resort, you have certain days, like the, the way it works is like on Tuesday, you get an hour early into the park and then an hour later. So you kind of are out there with nobody else, no general admission. So you kind of have an hour to like pick the ride you really want to go on um, and do it now because you're in, in an hour, general admission kicks in. And then at the end of the night, pick the ride you want because – you have an hour where no, like everyone else has to leave and you can stay. Um, but we went when we were in Animal Kingdom. This one guy's like, "Oh, you're looking for the Hidden Mickey's," and I was like, "Yeah." And then King Louie was in the middle of the street and, and Baloo, and I was like, "This is great!" Like you know, and uh, the guy's like, "Come here, come here, come here." And we went. And he's like, and we walked down on the thing, and he pulled up open this tarp, and there was a hidden Baloo behind the tarp. He's like, "There's the hidden Baloo." And I was like, oh, that's awesome. I was like, what? I was like, yeah, this park, the Animal Kingdom is one of the only parks that has a hidden, a, a, another hidden character that's not Mickey. And I was like, this is super sick, man. Like, I, it was so much fun. Um, now, are Here, they, here's, the, here's a fun tidbit about um, Animal Kingdom. If you look at it on Google Maps, um, on Google Earth, I guess, yeah. Expedition Everest is actually a hidden Mickey. Oh, see, that's awesome. Like, that's, yeah. <laughs> the, the way the track goes. Like, there's one point when you ride Expedition Everest and you're like, why are we just going around in a circle here? Nothing's happening. Well, it's actually done to complete the, the, the ear. Mickey. It's really yeah. funny. Um, yeah. Um, now, they're getting rid of the Tower of Terror, right? They're, they're changing it? Or is no. That a, or is that a at, rumor? At, at Disneyland, at Disneyland, they changed their Tower of Terror, which is at Disney's California Adventure, it's now themed to Guardians of the Galaxy. It's Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. Okay. But the Hollywood Tower Hotel, Hollywood Tower of Terror, is still at Disney's Hollywood Studios. Still, I was there yesterday. It was, it was still there. It was still operating. Good. That was a, good, that was a great that ride. That was a fantastic ride. Yeah, um, Tower of Terror, if you're, a, if you're a thrill seeker, not only do you get the thrills, but that ride is also like the pinnacle of theming. Like it's it starts when you're in the queue in the line waiting to get in and you see like the cobwebs Everywhere. that are on yeah, it's like the, the, it the, just the, starts to there's go. There's people dressed as like, bellhops and 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 you know what I mean that are zombies or ghosts. Like it's so cool. Yeah, they do everything really, really well. And now I know that, you know, there's the Aerosmith rock and roller coaster for all the irockradio.me fans love that ride which is a great ride now there are rumors that that might end up getting changed but nothing as of right now um but it is a an an awesome ride and if you love aerosmith because who doesn't love aerosmith Aerosmith. you know um and um yeah so there's that one yeah there's just there's a ton to do for absolutely everybody. And I know when you said that you stayed at, uh, you said just all-star music, I believe was what you said. Yep. Um, and they're not right now doing the extra magic hours just because of, um, everything that's going on. But one great thing when you do stay on property right now is that you are for all intents and purposes, um, guaranteed a park reservation because right now with everything they're doing they're trying to minimize how many people are in the park in a day so they're making everybody make a reservation to be in a park and it's really easy to get one if you do stay on property and they have the buses take you and they start letting the buses into the park before they let the cars park in the parking lot so while they don't officially have extra magic hours I can tell you from personal experience yesterday as somebody who drove from where he lives in Florida, the people who were staying in the resort got in early. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another cool, I had two other experiences in Disney I want to I want to share with you. I think you'll appreciate it. So I, I'm not a great artist, but I like to cartoon. So I can, I can draw a little bit. I have a little bit of skill. Um, I was much better back in the day than I am now because I, I haven't drawn in a long time. But uh, we went to, I think we were in... I think we were in MGM, and it was like 
I forget, but the park literally looked like you were walking down the street, and there was a bunch of shops on each side of it, and the street lights, and there was a trolley that goes down. It looked like old time, like an old time thing. Um, and when I went in this one gift shop, and there was a lady there, and she was just, it was just like a regular shop, and she was just in the middle, and she was drawing. And I was like, oh, and she would just take her drawing out, and she'd frame it, and she'd hang it up, and somebody can buy it if they wanted to. And I walked up, and I was watching her draw, and I was looking at it, and I go, you're cheating. She goes, excuse me? I said, you're tracing. She goes, what do you mean? I said, I could see through your paper. You're tracing the picture that you're doing. She goes, you think you could do better? I said, I could do better than tracing. And she goes, okay. And she takes her thing. She crumbled up her paper, and she threw it away. She walked around the counter. She opened up the, the hatch, and she goes, come on in. She put a fresh piece of paper down. She goes, draw. And I said, okay. So she starts talking to my parents, and I draw very fast. Like, I don't take my time. If I took my time, I would look a lot better. But So I look up on the wall, and I just see a steamboat Mickey, and I just looking up at it, and I'm just going, and I'm going, and I'm like, I'm done. And she goes, what do you mean you're done? And you've been there two minutes. And then she looks at it, and she goes, holy shit. She goes, <laughs> and then she looked under the paper to make sure I didn't trace it, and she's like, all right. So she goes behind the counter, and she takes a frame, and she takes the drawing out of the frame and puts my drawing in the frame, and then she, I guess she asked my parents for my, our, our, my name and our address, and I got a letter in the mail a couple weeks later saying that I was chosen to be the artist of the week in this shop so they took my drawing and like had it on the wall for a while that is the absolute coolest story i have ever heard man. yeah i was like this is cool like i don't i think we i don't even know if i still have the certificate but they sent me a certificate and stuff and uh yeah so she's like that was awesome she's like you called me out and you're you're a better artist than i am i was like yeah if you ever need they need that let me know i can get a <laughs> job here um and then we went to another place where it was like an animation where they teach you how to do the animation and they teach you how to do the art and we sat there, and they're like, all right, everyone in the room, you could pick a character you want us to draw. So I had the entire room. So sh sh fu funny that they did it, because I'm a big fan of the character. They, everyone picked Winnie the Pooh. So I actually have Winnie the Pooh tattooed on me. I don't know if you see that. Oh, oh wow. I love it. Yeah, I have Winnie the Pooh drinking a Gears iced tea. So if you're from school County, you know what Gears iced tea is. But yeah, I have, <laughs> Winnie, I have Winnie the Pooh tattooed on me. And we drew a Winnie the Pooh. And I drew it. And I remember it's like they're going, like, draw a circle, and then draw this. And I'm just like... And then they had what it's supposed to finish look like in the corner, and I just finished the drawing, and I kind of just sat there. And the lady's like, you're not participating? I'm like, I'm done. And she goes, what, what you? I was like, it's Winnie the Pooh. We're not, drawing, we're not drawing anything crazy here. And she comes over and looks at it and goes, oh, wow, you're very talented. I was like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a car I can't draw realism, but I can do cartooning. And I, I think she took my paper, too, and she was like, I, so it, it was both times I had really cool like art experiences where they were like, I got to draw while I was at Disney, and people were were, were were enjoying it. Yeah, that is that's those are really awesome stories. And I want to challenge you, man. Do some drawing in the next week. Yeah, you should do on, something on top of my just, podcasting. Just to I'll, get figure, I'll figure back time. In, yeah. <laughs> You're furloughed, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, but it was it was awesome, man. Like I I I had a blast there. I think two of the besides my amazing wife who just snuck in the kitchen here. The two of the prettiest females I've ever seen in my life were Disney. Um, one of them was the girl who played uh, Jasmine, and the other one was the girl who played Pocahontas. I just remember being a 20-year-old kid and just staring at the, <laughs> the, the lady who's playing Pocahontas like she was not from this world. I was like, you are the most beautiful creature I have ever seen in my life. And then she walked out with a boa, a boa constrictor, and I quickly left. <laughs> I was like, you're no longer pretty. Bye-bye. <laughs> I don't like snakes. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. No, yeah. Um, it is, you know, I know like a lot of it's geared towards families, but you definitely, um, you really w will ha have a great time. And um, there's so much to do. And I know like you, you went once and you still have all these memories. And yeah. that's one of my favorite parts of doing what I do is knowing that you're kind of like, even if it's just a small part. You're this small part in something that I'll, I'm the good Lord. Will, well, I don't think they'd be able to figure it out anyway, but earlier today I was on and I was uh, putting together a trip for a woman whose um, kids don't know that when they open the presents from Santa on new year, on Christmas Eve, that they are going to be opening the present, packing and getting on a red eye. Like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So those are the types of memories that I like. 
to well, know that I'm well. They do the watch thing now, right? I see people when they say they're going to Disney, they get a set of watches. Yeah, if you stay on property, um, you get actually. Um, we're staying next week, so you get you get your magic bands in the mail. Um, these are for people who stay on property, and then that's going to be your your room key. <laughs> it's your park ticket. Um, back when your they, they're not doing fast passes right now, but back when they had fast passes, your fast passes were saved on it. And um, it does really make everything a whole lot easier, but it's really fun when you finally get the magic bands in the mail because they send them about 30 days beforehand. So that's when it really gets to start to feel real for you mm -hmm. and everything. Um, and I know that kids absolutely love that because that's one of the things that you'll wrap up for them or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think our room key was like a big deal for us. Like if you had your room key, your room key got you in your room. And then when you went to a park, if you got your photo taken on a ride, you just kind of swipe your room key. And then that kind of saves to like an email and it sends you your photo from your, your ride experience. If you're at a shop, like I remember I bought my wife. She's a huge Winnie the Pooh fan too. Um, I bought her a huge Winnie the Pooh doll, and I also bought a King Louis stuffed animal because you never <laughs> find King Louis stuff. And uh, I remember being like, fuck, I want this stuff because I don't know if we're coming back here. Now I have to carry this goddamn thing around. The lady's like, uh, give your card. And I was like, yeah. And I gave it to her, and she's like, all right, cool. And then she's like, took it and put it, left it behind the counter. Well, she goes, are you staying in the park? I said, yeah. And I said, oh, she goes, do you have your room key? I said, yes. Because I, I was old enough that I was able to get on a like with a bus and go to any park I wanted to early, and then I would just meet up with my parents later on that day, and because uh, I was kind of like solo in it around Disney, so I went and I got I gave her my room key, and she's like, "All right, we'll see you later." And I was like, well, "Can I have my stuff?" She goes, "Do you want to carry it around all day?" And I was like, well, "What are you gonna do?" She goes, "Well, we're gonna either we'll we'll do one of two things: we can have it shipped to your room, or whatever address is on your file, we'll just ship it to your house." And I was like, "What?" She goes, yeah, we're not going to make you carry on a stuffed animal all day. And I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> One of, um, and now some of this stuff, just in the interest of full disclosure, some of those things absolutely still are things, but not right now during the COVID, COVID. Yeah. Because of, but, um, so I just want to, in the interest of full disclosure, but on Christmas Eve last year, I was, I met up with a friend from Michigan who came down and, um, we rode the new Star Wars Rise, this Rise of the Resistance, where you kind of have to get there early and get a boarding pass, and it's a whole thing. But anyway, so his wife was like, by like one o'clock when we got off the ride, she was like, I'm out, you know? Like, so she went back to the hotel, and we're just hanging around, uh, the two of us hanging around Hollywood Studios, hanging around Galaxy's Edge. And we went into a little shop and he found um, it was a replica of the chess set that they play in the Millennium Falcon. Oh my God, that's and awesome! I, and I, he's like, "Should I get it?" He's like, "I, they can ship it back to my house." I'm like, "If that's less than seventy five dollars, you are buying it." It was fifty dollars. <laughs> yeah. So he just picked it up. He he grabbed it off the shelf, gave it to the person at the register. They rang it up, and he just left. Yeah. Like he didn't even have to put it in a bag and they just, you know, sent it back for him. So yeah, some of that stuff isn't there right now, but they are so incredibly accommodating with so many things. Yeah. And like you said, um, you can find a lot of stuff that you didn't even like, you've got a King. Do you still have your King Louie? I do. Yep. That's awesome. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, and it's uh, it's definitely a great way to, you know, spend a trip. I know that I have a lot of people who are starting to feel a little more comfortable again, and that's. I hope that that continues. I hope that the numbers continue to drop and everything. And I feel like we're moving in the right direction with some of that stuff. Um, and obviously for the shameless plug because i look at you you're looking at your phone anyway. no i was texting my wife i was texting my <laughs> wife to bring down my king louis <laughs> i want to show you too oh, yeah yeah that's awesome um uh, no well, now here's here's a like so people they can go to the link below and they can go through you and book a trip um i think if i were to book disney soon um i would i would like to experience it during halloween time 
I feel like that would be because I know they change the park a little bit to certain holidays and certain things. Is there is for someone who's done it as many times as you have? Uh, what are some of your pro tips, or how would you go about doing things if if you were setting up a, a vacation to go to Disney? So most years um, they have Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party, which happens on select nights during the Halloween season. This year they're not having it; they have canceled that. Actually, they just announced yesterday that they're also not going to be doing the Christmas party. However, they are still decorating and the decorations for Halloween are off the charts. Mm -hmm. Um, They have some really cool decorations all down main street USA and they are starting those next Wednesday, the fifth September 15th is where They were going to initially have them up August 13th because Disney usually starts Halloween way too early. Yeah. But they want to Like pumpkin beers and Oktoberfest are out already. (laughs) Right. They want everybody to, um, who has to get back to school to be able to experience it before that. And I understand that. But they held off this year. They're going to be starting September 15th. They're going to have all the decorations out. They've actually relaxed the rules um, where because they're not having the Halloween party where adults could dress in a costume, they're now letting adults dress in a costume starting September 15th. Nice. So if you want that special, I don't know what costume pick. And obviously within reason, people, yeah. <laughs> there are some rules. No slave layers. But... <laughs> <laughs> um... I mean, I, I would be a fan of it, uh, but I don't think Disney would. <laughs> and... Um... You know, there, there, are, there are rules and they're on the website and everything, but, you know, so they're actually letting adults dress in character or in costume for the Halloween season. And there are a lot of great offerings. They'll have some special snacks and some special offerings. It is, um, there is certainly a lot that goes on. And then the Christmas decorations are really a whole thing. I hope they still do the gingerbread houses at some of the resorts. Um, I haven't seen if they're going to be doing that or, or not yet, but those are breathtaking. And sometimes we would just, you know, go from monorail to monorail or bus to bus and just go to the resorts and look at their tree and their, um, and their gingerbread house and, and things like that. And that those are all things that you can do. You don't even have to be in a theme park to do them. And yeah. there's a lot like that. So it is probably the best time for theming to go is around October because you have the weather starts to get better because it's probably starting to get better for you now. But yeah. here it's still hot as you know what. Um, <laughs> The weather starts to get a little better in October. That's when kids kind of stop making the trip because of school. Now, I don't know how that's going to be affected by at-home school and everything. But uh, that's always, when I lived in Arizona or when I lived in Pennsylvania, we always liked October as a time to go. Yeah, we went in September and when when I went last time. And it was good because it wasn't as busy. Um, but the problem was it was like their downtime. So there was some rides that like we rode the Aerosmith ride. And I think two people after like two more rides after us, they shut the ride down for like the next three, four weeks. Cause they were doing maintenance on it. So, the, and then like the only, I never got to ride the ride, the haunted mansion cause it was shut down for renovations. So I never got to ride the haunted mansion. Um, there was a few, um, I had never wanted to ride it anyway because I just, as a kid, I remember watching tapes on it and I hated it as a kid, but the, we are the, um, the, the the, the, it's a small world. It's a small world that was shut down. Um, so there was a few a few rides that because the time frame that we went, it was like their their slow time. So it was time for them to shut down rides and renovate them and make sure they're all up to specs and stuff. So there's a few rides if that we you didn't ride Haunted Mansion, then we have to get you back down because that might be the best ride. I love horror um, stuff and, and spooky and horror. Like so, that would be my favorite. Yeah, I wanted to ride that. I rode the Tower Tower probably like ten times. I loved it so much. So Universal, get it, if you love Halloween and stuff like that, Universal usually has their Halloween Horror Nights. They uh, canceled them this year, but they did do this tribute store, which is all Halloween themed. And I kid you not, they have Beetlejuice as a snake. And 
you can see the the tail on in the shadows oh on my the God. they did this so incredibly well we're here for your daughter um, chuck <laughs> that's what he says the as a snake Beetlejuice section is so good man i love beetlejuice as well, a 90s kid he, he used to have a kid, ride right um well i think he had a boy did he have a ride he might have had a ride back i remember he was always advertised on nickelodeon like the beetlejuice ride or the beetlejuice thing and there was a guy dressed as beetlejuice that would hang out and talk to kids and um what was the other one that i always wanted to ride when i was a kid the back to the future ride the Back to the Future ride is now the Simpsons ride. Like they they adapted that section of the park. Um, the Back oh, you to can the go Future to Moe's. Ride, like you can go to Moe's bar, right, and get like a beer. You can get a flaming Mo, dude. <laughs> uh, you can get a non-alcoholic flaming Mo. I don't know if you can get it, but yeah, and they have Duff beer. Oh yeah, man. If you love the Simpsons, they've got a whole bunch of cool stuff. You can eat um, frying Dutchman seafood. <laughs> um, the donuts, I the got, big donuts. Yes, the pink donuts. Yep. yep. You can get them at uh, Lard Lads Donuts. They have a stand. <laughs> they have uh, the bee man, or the bee guy. I don't remember. Did they get, what did they get rid of a Pooh's grocery a t- store? Because all the controversy with that. Well, no, they do have the Quickie Mart. Um, Just a is there any actual ref? I guess there is a picture of Apu in there still. Yeah. I think that kind of bums me out. I mean, I, I, a part of me gets why they do it. A part of me is like, come on, really? Like, I don't know. he wasn't made to be offensive. He was a character. Like, I don't know. I like a poo. A poo is is um, maybe a tough one. I think the only thing that people like, Simpsons. I'm not going to get into the into the controversy. Yeah. I think the only thing people have a problem with is that it was a a white dude doing the impression. I yeah, think but... that if you had an uh, an, I, I think that's what. I'm not taking either that, side. Of yeah, the that's issue, that. That was that was the issue. That's why people are offended. Like, if if someone who is white is doing the voice of a person of color, they wanted that changed. But like, I also grew up in a time where I watched the Rugrats, and and a lot of the little kid boys were voiced by women. And guess what? I'm an adult, and I don't care. It just it's still the well, character. Bart Simpson is voiced by women. Yeah, it's, woman. so so now are we gonna take away jobs from women because they're doing voices of boy characters? Like, no, just. If you're good for the job, you're good for the job. That's what voice acting is all about. You work um, really hard to do that voice for a reason. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Um, I yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna. No, know, I understand. I, don't even I understand. 100 percent know a whole a whole lot about that issue, but I do think that there is uh, the quickie marks there, and yeah, because The Simpsons always like being somebody about our age, and I don't know your exact age, but I think we're pretty close. Thirty. Three, I think I am. I think I'm around there. I don't know. I lose track. You're 33. Yeah. Okay. Then I then I'm a lot older than you. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I um, but people our age like the Simpsons. I mean, the Simpsons has been around almost your entire life. Yeah. Like I, I was a kid started who started. You were what three? Yep. I had I had Bartman shoes that he says, and I had a Bartman shirt that I got in trouble for wearing to uh, elementary school because it said "Eat my shorts." Did you ever see the crossover episode of Family Guy and The Simpsons? Yeah, I was. I used to love Family Guy, and then I, 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 I outgrew it very quickly. I was like, "This is not funny to me anymore." I don't. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't get into it. I, I like the Sim. I think if I had to say, I, I like the Simpsons more than Family Guy. Uh, my cartoon right now, though, is uh, is Bob's Burgers. I absolutely love Bob's Burgers. That's that's awesome. I was just gonna the the point I was gonna make was uh, they when that crossover episode of The Simpsons and Family Guy, they really make it look almost quaint how parents used to be so afraid of The Simpsons yeah. when we were kids and yep. they used to like not want us to wear Simpsons stuff. I remember I had a cousin who wasn't allowed to watch The Simpsons, and now like and then when you look Park at hit. the cartoon <laughs> la- landscape, like. The Simpsons are the innocent show that they're putting in theme parks. Yeah. Like, well, they're I, on Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah, is it um, is it Universal that's doing the Mario Land? Yeah. So there is they're opening it up in Japan, and they were going to do an entire new theme park, Epic Universe, and they were going to be putting the Super Nintendo Land in that new theme park. That theme park has now been indefinitely postponed because of the financial hit, but I can't imagine, and this is just 100% speculation on my part, 
that they're not going to want to do this Super Nintendo Land in some way. In Florida, then, right? I'm hoping, yeah. Yeah. That, that was where it was supposed that to happen. That would explode. Explode. It would, the it, Super Nintendo Land is yeah, yeah. That would be great. I know there's a, a a place up in the Niagara Falls area. I think it's on the Canada side though. Uh, they built a go kart track that's one of the um, Super Mario courses, like the one you go up the hill. Oh, and down the that's hill. awesome! Yeah, um, yeah. So I've seen that. Um, a couple more questions here, and then we'll let you go. But if yeah. it, um. The Universal, do they still have, like, I know they got rid of the Jaws ride. I always wanted to ride that as a kid, and I heard, I heard that's not a thing anymore. Um, is the King Kong thing there where you still, like, King Kong gets, like, right in your face? And So the original King Kong ride is not there anymore. But now, because now Universal used to just be Universal Studios, mm -hmm. and now there's Universal Studios, there's Universal's Islands of Adventure, and then they have a water park slash theme park called Volcano Bay. But... When they built Islands of Adventure, they wanted to take some of the properties and put them over in a new one so that it wasn't, you know, unbalanced. Yeah. So they took Kong and now they have uh, Kong Skull Island oh, over there. Oh, so they did a new Kong. So he's even it bigger. Is, so it's new technology. There's a lot of, like, 3D technology at the beginning. But, spoiler alert, at the end you come really close to Kong. And it is... Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that is one of my favorite rides at Universal. It's not necessarily a thrill ride. Like, it's a lot of virtual stuff, so it's not like a roller coaster or anything. But when you see some of the way, you know, and it's like one of those things where you don't even 100% know how they did everything. Um, yeah, that's a really cool one. Hopefully, and with that's the one that has King Kong Godzilla, that has maybe they'll put them both in. They, that'd be cool too. Yeah, I, I love I love I, monster movies. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff at Universal. It is, um, especially if you're more of a thrill seeker. They have like the Hulk roller coaster. Um, the Spider Man ride is not a thrill ride, but that's really cool. They're just building right now, like as we speak, a new Jurassic Park roller coaster Ooh. that just looks off the chains. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they're they're always constantly, and it's my favorite thing about Universal existing is that now Disney has this competition, and in theme parks at least, I think a rising tide lifts all boats. Like, so Disney does Pandora, the world of Avatar, and Universal's like, oh, I got you. Here's the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, and then Disney's like, Star checkmate, Wars. Galaxy's Edge. <laughs> And that's why Universal was trying to be like, oh, I'll raise you a Galaxy's Edge and bring you a, uh, a Super Mario Land or a Super Nintendo Land. But we'll see what happens with that. But yeah, what, there's a lot of cool What stuff. fantasy, uh, what realm would you like to see either park do next? Like if you had, like Disney, you get to pick one for Disney and one for Universal. Like what, what would you like to see a world enter the fray there? So there's certainly rumors that... Um, there's going to be some sort of Lord of the Rings. That would be fantastic. That would be my go-to. Just that, it would be unbelievable to see just like that universe come to life. And that would be something that they would talk about uh, for Universal and Lord of the Rings. I I was not a huge fan of the movies. Um, never read the books, but um, I had an ex-girlfriend who was into them. So sometimes when you watch a three and a half hour movie with somebody that you're like, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know? uh, but for, for so me, I'm really not a huge fan either, Lord. but I think the way they did Harry Potter, I think they would kill it with Lord of the Rings. I think they would absolutely destroy it. I think you're right. Or like a game of um, Thrones. Yeah. Game of Thrones would be a cool one too. I think that one of the things that I, so Lord of the Rings, I think would be a great thing for universal. I think one of the things I like that Disney does is they take something that's not as huge and they give you something really. So this is such a ridiculous answer to your question. But one of the properties that Disney got when they bought Fox was MASH. And I think it would be off the chains if one of the resorts got Rosie's Bar from MASH. <laughs> Yeah, And I think they could do that so well. And I know it's for older people, and I know I'm older. 
But like, and I know it's not fantasy or anything, but I think that would be something that they could bring to life and it could be a bar to, because kids don't know MASH anyway, so you don't need to appeal to them. And it could be a place that you could go, the adults could go, leave the kids back in the room because they're safe at Disney. And, you know, you just throw down a couple beers at Rosie's Bar. Yeah. Um, the My two favorite rides at Disney when I were there w- was two rides that, like, were not, I kind of think they're meant to be, like, cool rides, but I love them. But the one where you go, you you enter, I don't even remember what it was called, but it was in the MGM park. I think it was the MGM ride where you, like, you're in a theater, and then you go into the theater, and, like, you just ride through all the different movie properties. I thought that was super, super cool because I'm a big movie guy. And then we did that. We did the back lot tour where you get like they kind of show you a little bit of special effects. Then you get the ride and you get to see props from movies. You get to see the Psycho House on the hill up there. And I was like, these are my. They were my two absolute favorite. Like the Indiana Jones show was my favorite thing ever there. Like I just like those movie properties coming to life in front of me or seeing props or stuff like that. The Indiana Jones uh, stunt show is. St- I mean, they're not doing it at the very moment because of COVID, but that is still there. Unfortunately, the backlot tour became Star Wars Galaxy's Edge mm-hmm. and Toy Story Land. And they actually just right before the closures, they took out the great movie ride and put in Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, um, which is the new ride there. Um, and it is almost hard to explain how cool this Mickey and Minnie's runaway railway ride is because like we're adults, like we're rockers. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, and it doesn't seem like being in a Mickey mouse cartoon would seem that cool, but just the way they did it. And, um, it feels like you're in a damn cartoon, That's awesome. <laughs> which is, which is amazing. I just did it again yesterday. It was the last ride I did yesterday before I left. Um, because the line was only 55 minutes. That was the shortest. Well, like that's how much people like this, even at reduced capacity. Oh wow. It's still, it's still like in such demand that people love this new ride. Yeah. The, the, I do miss the great movie ride because that was so cool where they would have like, you know, the wicked witch of the West, like yep. in an animatronic form and the al- al- there was alien a scene from alien. Yeah. The alien <laughs> shot down at you. Yeah. That was super cool. Um, the other ride that I was really looking forward to going to see when I was there, but because um, all my family told me about it because I know I like scary stuff, and then when I went there, it was completely revamped and it's no longer scary, but uh, there was an alien encounter ride where an actual alien would come and you thought you were going to die, and they change it to being another character who I'd like to get tattooed on this arm is Stitch. I'm a big Stitch fan. Um, so yeah, that was another really cool ride too, but... So, so in closing, we, we, I, I will be hitting you up possibly very soon. Um, hopefully, uh, <laughs> once this COVID all goes away, I would like to, we, we want to book a trip to Disney, but, uh, or Universal. Um, but if, so in closing, we talked a lot of Disney Universal stuff and also a lot of music. So I'm going to, you, you have to add uh, Desert Island question me here, uh, Desert Island ant question here. You can bring five, five albums with you on a Desert Island and five, five Universal properties and five Disney properties. Okay, five albums. I'm going to try to take an eclectic group so that I am not stuck with, like I could easily just take five Pearl Jam albums, and, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take, I'll just take Pearl Jam 10. Uh, that's sort of the defining one there. You can, you can cheat and say greatest hits. You can take a Pearl Jam, so you have a, a bunch. <laughs> okay, I'll do I'll do Pearl Jam greatest hits. They did put together a pretty good, and that's a double. So then I, I I'm sort of cheating a little bit there yeah, too. Yeah, well, that's alright. Um, and then I'm gonna go with uh, Everclear, Sparkle, and Fade. That's a that's a good one. That's one that I really like a lot. Um, I'm going to. Bringing it all back home, Bob Dylan. I'm going to get into my pop sensibilities here and go with Lord's Melodrama. Okay. I absolutely love that album. Every time I hear Lord, I think, uh, the, Lord, not Lord, but Lord, the, the, the singer uh, is a South Park. I am Lord, la, la, la. I am Lord, la, la, la. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was, uh, that was quite, that was quite uh, a funny sketch. Um <laughs> And um, to round it out, 
I will go with um, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by the Beatles. I like it. Do you ever hear um, Cheap Trick do the cover of that album? No. It's fantastic. Yeah, look up Cheap Trick doing Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. It's a whole like... That's awesome. Yeah, it's really, really good. <laughs> okay, so then five... Disney properties, so we're talking about like things that they own, like yeah. so, like groups of movies or something. Yep. All right. Well, obviously Star Wars. Um, I'd have to say The Simpsons. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, I guess they technically own Mash, so I'm going to go with Mash too. If I have to, the like things that I can only watch those things on a desert island. So if I got The Simpsons and Mash, then I've got like a good forty some seasons of television, <laughs> and then I've got, I've got a pretty good three set of trilogies for Star Wars. So that'll give me a lot of movies. Um, I don't know. I might get made fun of for being a forty year old man who says I'll t- I'll take the princess line. Like I I like Mulan. I like. Did you see the new Mulan you know, yet? Brave. The new Milan, yeah, we got it. We got it the day it came out. Oh, wow. We absolutely loved it. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not. I'm not willing to pay that. I'm already paying the subscription. I'm not paying the thirty dollars for it. I'll wait for December. You, you'll get it in December. Yeah. Um, it it's a lot different. So, um, you know, there are people who are complaining about it, like, you know, oh, there's no, there's not the songs, and there's not Mushu or whatever. But like, it's so different that if you're comparing it to. It's comparing apples to oranges, yeah. but it's really, really good, and it's beautifully shot. So, okay, so then I got one more Disney property. Um, I will go with – not a huge guy, Pirates movies or um, – oh, shoot, Pixar. I'll take Pixar. <laughs> those, those movies are always good for a good cry when you need it. Yeah. Like, um. And then Universal Properties is, let me think. I'm trying to think exactly what they. I am disappointed you didn't say the Muppets. I'm going to say that, though. I was, I'm a big uh, Muppets fan. Shoot. <laughs> I didn't think of it. Uh, you know, they you have, drop the they have at Hollywood you... Studios, they have Muppets 3D, yeah. which was actually the last thing voiced by Jim Henson mm-hmm. before he passed. And, um, it's so old. Yeah. And it still stands up so well. Like I, I have a bad eye, I so laugh that... every time. <laughs> yeah. I have a bad eye, so that, that old style three D technology does not fully work for me. Oh yeah, yeah, I can get that. I when I when I was younger I had a lazy eye, so I think it's this one. But uh yeah. So that old old that old that old style three D doesn't work for me. That new like when you go to theaters now it does work, but like the, the Bugs Life one, I got nothing out of it. I got nothing out of the, the, the Muppets and I got nothing out of the honey I shrunk their kids rides when I was there. Just because it was an old school three D technology, it didn't do anything. But um my the other thing that always catches me is Fozzie comes on and goes Oh, I'm in 3D. Maybe I'm even. Fu- I'll be more funny in 3D, or I'll be maybe I'll be more funny because I'm in 3D. And he goes, "You weren't even funny in 2D." Ah, the guys in the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know. I just I love oh, the Muppets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, it is. There's something about they. They used to have um, a show, great moments in history, uh, with the Muppets that was at Magic Kingdom. And it was called Great Moments in History, but only the American parts. And it was like Sam Eagle would host it. And man, that was just like, and there was one line like, um, the peasants are angry. And then the peasants go, we are angry. And it's like, the peasants are have something else. And then the peasants are revolting. And they all go, we are revolting. <laughs> just that Muppet's humor is so funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Universal, um, I mean, you know, from th- from properties where they have rides, um, you know, I definitely, like, I really love, see, there, I kind of, they aren't the properties that I necessarily grew up loving, so I'm maybe not as attached to the property as the rides, so I'll just give you five rides that I love there, mm-hmm. and that is that Kong Skull Island, I absolutely love. Um, if I could pop that on my desert Island, that would be great. Uh, the Spider-Man ride is off the charts. Good. Um, the, 
Um, let me try to think what else they got there that I really, really love. Um, I always love to ride the ET ride. Um, that is oh, ET yeah. so big, and it it has this smell um, that is so distinct to it. That, like, every time I walk into the queue, I make sure every time I'm at Universal, I ride E.T. And every time I get in that queue and I smell it, I just get happy. Like, I don't even I, I do don't know. Even e. know was how in Star Wars? That. Yeah, it was in, um, it was one of the prequels, right? Yeah. He's he was, hip, hip, oh, the, two E.T.s are standing uh, as the ship's taking off out of a, like a, a, a carrier. Oh, okay. Yep. I thought they were also in one of the prequels. weren't one of, weren't they in the Senate? That, yeah, there was like there was two in the Senate too. Yeah, that they're yeah. they're up on a balcony. <laughs> like unless you're not looking for them, you won't see them. Yeah, I am the Senate. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, so those three rides. Um, I'm not a huge thrill ride guy, so I don't always go on these. But Hagrid's the ro- the new roller coaster in. Um, Wizarding World is next level good. It's really, really a great ride. I'm not a thrill ride fan, and when I go a whole, when I go as, as regularly as I go, um, a lot of times I don't like Ooh. on a random Tuesday want to shake everything up like that. Your your mic just Are got you crazy. Get... Yeah, your mic just got a little weird there. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I heard that. Okay, too. so that was on my end. I don't, I'm not sure. Well, either way, I'll go with Hagrid's, and then um, we'll try this. You know, if you have kids, the Minions ride's really cool too. So I'll throw in the Minions rides for people with kids. All right, uh, I think we'll end it there because we are having weird technical difficulties. We're, we've been here a long time. We're just at the two-hour mark. But Rick, I, I really want to thank you. Um, I had a blast here, man. Anytime this platform is always open for you. If you start your podcast, you need a guest. I'll always join you as well. Um, we had a great talk, man, the radio. Uh, so definitely go down below, check out all the links. Uh, go listen to irockradio.me. If you're looking to book a trip down to Florida, uh, Rick's got you covered. He, he's, he's, he knows the insides and outs of everything down there in, in Disney uh, and Universal. And, uh, and that'll, uh, anything else you want to, just uh, closing remarks? Yeah, I'm just going to say this uh, for anybody who is, all my social links are down there. So if you just like them and we'll keep the conversation going, and if you do book through me, my services are always 100% free to you. Nice. So Nice. All right, man. Well, thank you so much. We'll get out of here. This is the Interviews with Everyday People. Uh, here's some Mahantungo. Uh, make sure you check that, that, that band out as well. We're out of here.